yesterday when I was recording cell division lecture, I was having a lot of trouble with the loom. I think it was because a lot of people suddenly start using loom for their online teaching. So the system might be um, just simply overwhelmed. So hopefully everything uh, is going smoothly. Um, last time we stopped at crossing over. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So between prophase and metaphase, you are going to have a transition stage called a pro-metaphase. Pro means like prior to, right? So this happens right before our metaphase. And if you remember from the previous video, because everything happens in meiosis of one, so we're going to assign number one to all these different stages. And then during meiosis two, everything will happen number two. So the key event uh, happens that, that happens in pro-metaphase of one is the attachment of spinal fibers to kinetochore proteins. So where are the kinetochore proteins? So you can read this, but in this figure, uh, if you remember, this is after DNA has duplicated, right? So for each chromosome, you're going to have two identical copies, and we call them sister chromatates. So over here, where everything really kind of narrows, it's almost like you're pinching the two sister chromatates. This spot is called a centromere. So the kinetochore proteins are going to be at centromere. So what happens is you're going to have uh, spinal, uh, sorry, spinal fiber uh, microtubules uh, coming here and attach themselves to kinetochore proteins. So that during uh, meiosis one, the two homologous chromosomes will be separated, right? So the spinal fibers are going to pull this homologous chromosome to one direction, and then the other homologous chromosome will be pulled to the opposite direction, and they will end up in two different cells, two different daughter cells, all right? Now, there's a term here. At the end of pro-metaphase one, each tetrad is attached to microtubules from both poles. So what is a tetrad? Now, if you look at this pair of homologous chromosomes, how many sister chromatids do you see? Four, right? So because each chromosome has two sister chromatids. So together, one, two, three, four. So that's four. Now, tetrad means a four. So basically, it means a pair of homologous chromosomes, right? Because it contains four sister chromatids. Okay. Now, this one, I just kind of know where it is. It's really not any critical information. So chiasma is the plura, and the singular is a chiasma. So you can just think of it as where the sister chromatids from a different chromosomes kind of come into contact. Okay. Um, so this is pro-metaphase. And then in metaphase, the homologous pairs will be arranged in the center of the cell. Remember, we call that equator or metaphase plate. Um, and then they're going to face opposite poles because they will move away from each other and they're going to end up in opposite directions, opposite poles. So in metaphase of one, homologous chromosomes will um, orient themselves randomly at the equator. This is very important. So there might be a question on the test asking you, so uh, when do homologous chromosomes um, orient themselves randomly at the metaphase plate or at the equator? So the answer is going to be metaphase. And in that process, you're going to have a phenomenon called a random assortment. So what is a random assortment? Um, before I show you that, remember this. This is very important. Random assortment, just like crossing over, can introduce genetic diversity into the offspring. And this is how it works. So I'm going to show you this picture. Um, you can use the previous one, too, um, but just for simplicity, uh, let's use this one. Um, actually, I have a title here, families similar uh, and yet different. Um, you and your siblings are not exactly the same, right? Even though you come from the same parents. Uh, and then I'm going to explain why. So let's go back to random assortment. So you have uh, two cells over here, and this is a metaphase of one. So you can see that the homologous pairs have a kind of line up at the equator, right? So this is the equator. Now, when they move and line up around the equator, their movement is very random. Okay? So you may have this cell where, let's say the black uh, represents the, the father. So the two chromosomes, different types of chromosomes, remember? So this, we can call it this chromosome one, this chromosome two. So you can see in this scenario, the two chromosomes from the father line up on one side, and then the two chromosomes from the mother line up on the other side. So at the end of meiosis one, you can have two new daughter cells, which will contain different chromosomes, right? So this cell contains the two chromosomes from the mother. This cell contains the two from the mother. 
And once they undergo meiosis II, the sister chromatids will be separated. These are the two gametes that you are going to end up with. So you can see they're different. All right. Now, this is only one scenario. What's the second scenario? Because everything is um, um, kind of moved randomly, right? So it's very possible that you may have the second scenario where you have the big chromosome from the father um, and then you have the small chromosome from the mother. They just happen to end up on one side of the equator. And on the other side of the equator, you have the big red from the, the mother and the small black from the father. Uh, if you have this scenario, uh, you're going to have these two cells, right? And then once they finish meiosis II, you're going to have these two types of gametes. And you can clearly see that these gametes are all different from each other, right? They have a different combinations of chromosomes, so their genetic makeup will be different. So in this case, you can see that if you have two homologous pairs, you are going to end up with four unique gametes. Four unique gametes. So the equation is actually pretty easy. I'm, I can tell you right now. So that's two to the second, that's a four. So this is a fixed number, uh, it's constant. Uh, and this represents the number of homologous pairs. Okay. So number of pairs. So if the cell has two pairs of homologous chromosomes, if the cell goes through meiosis, it's going to generate different, uh, it's going to generate four different gametes. So what if the cell has three pairs of homologous chromosomes? So that means you're going to multiply three twos together, so two by two by two. So that's going to be eight. Right? What if the cell has four pairs of chromosome, uh, homologous chromosomes? Two by two by two by two, and that's going to be 16. All right. So, you know, this phenomena of different kind of pair up of uh, or different combinations of homologous chromosomes. So this is called a random uh, assortment. And that's going to be the second source for introducing genetic diversity. All right. Now, here's my question. We know that humans have how many pairs of homologous chromosomes? 23, right? So you have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, and that's a total of 46 chromosomes. So if you are making um, gametes, um, so if you're, you're going to make either sperms or eggs, so how many unique gametes can you produce? You know? So we're going to use this equation, all right? So 2 to the 23rd. And it's going to be more than 8 million different possible gametes. Okay. So that means you, every single one of us can make possibly over 8 million different gametes. They all carry different combinations of chromosomes, so uh, different genetic makeup. So when each gamete becomes a zygote and eventually a baby, um, that baby will have um, a unique um, genetic makeup. Then if the baby comes from another of your gametes, uh, that's different. Okay. Um, now, what's the chance? You, you know, um, let me go back a little bit. Okay, so let's go back to this question. So families are similar yet different. So you and your siblings are 99.9999999% different, right? So if you haven't really had any siblings who are identical to you, right? Unless, now there's an ex exception, unless you guys are identical twins, then you will be different and you will be the same. But um, for people who are not identical twins, you rarely, rarely, rarely see uh, any two siblings are exactly the same, right? And this is why. Because for each person, we can generate over 8 million different possible gametes. Now for a couple, this is from the father, right? So the father, this symbol for males, a father can make over 8 million different gametes. And this is for the symbol for male, sorry, it's for females. So the mother can also make over 8 million unique gametes. So when you take a one from the father, that will become the sperm. That's going to be one in eight million, right? If you take an egg from the mother, again, the chance is one in eight million. So when you multiply 
the two numbers together, the chance that you and your sibling will come from ex from the same gametes with exactly the same genetic makeup is a one in. This is a huge number, right? So let's say, uh, let's see, this is a thousand million trillion billion, right? So the chance is a one in sixty four billion. Now I think that's all pretty small, right? It's even smaller than hitting a jackpot. But wait, there is more. Okay, so that's not the end of the story. There is another event that will make the number even smaller. So you and your sibling, are, and chances are you are never going to be genetic, genetically identical. Okay, remember we still have crossing over, right? That can uh, also enable even greater variety. So if you have exchange of genetic material here between the uh, the two uh, chromosomes, but they're, they're not uh, sister chromatids because they're not from the same chromosome, but they're kind of line up right next to each other. So that's going to further make the chromosome after uh, meiosis one a different. So that's going to further uh, decrease that chance that two um, siblings are going to be exactly the same. Okay, so it's a very, very, very small chance. Okay, so I have a practice question. So this question will really test your ability or your understanding, really, um, how meiosis will work. Um, and especially how the random assortment work. Okay, so here's my question. How many possibilities? So really, I mean, how many unique gametes? How many unique gametes? Uh, this is a typo. Would you have if you have three pairs of homologous chromosomes? So that means it's six chromosomes in total. Can you draw all the possibilities? Um, so I recommend that you just pause here, give yourself a few minutes to draw on your own, right? If you don't do it on yourself, you just look at my answer, you're never going to understand. Because when you just look at something, you think you understand, but chances are that if you actually do it, you don't know how to do it. So pause the video right here. Actually, I'm going to pause it and then I will draw my answer so that you can look at it later. Okay, so here is my drawing. Hopefully you have done that yourself. Now, um, so we have three pairs of homologous chromosomes. So you can see that uh, we should have four scenarios, right? So four possible cells before meiosis. So this is the first scenario where you have uh, all the chromosomes from the mother line up one, on one side, and then all the chromosomes from the father line up in the other side. If you divide that one, uh, at the end of meiosis one, this is what you're gonna have, right? These three end up in one cell, and then the three blue one end up in the other cell. And then if you go through meiosis two, further divide, the sister chromatids, this is going to be cell number one, cell number two, and then divide these two. And you can see, uh, sorry, I'm just going to say this is a possibility one because these two cells are identical, right? So that's the first possibility. And this is the second possibility where everybody only has the, the father's chromosomes. Um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, I don't really have any fancy tool to um, indicate the three different types of chromosomes. So I'm just using the size. So this is going to be the largest one. I'm going to call it a big chromosome, and this is a medium, and then this is small. Okay. And then this is the second scenario. So you can see that when they line up around the equator, the, the red big blue medium and red small line up in one side of the equator. And then you have the other group line up on the other side. So if they divide, this is what we're going to have, right? The big red, blue medium, and the small red. So uh, these are the two daughter cells at the end of meiosis one. And then if they go through meiosis two, the uh, two sister chromatids are going to further divide. So this is what you end up with. Okay? So this is possibility number three because we're looking at the possibilities of gametes, right? And then this is number four. So can you tell one, one, two, three, four are totally different, right? They have the different combinations of chromosomes. So I only did the first two scenarios. So maybe you guys can do the, the third scenario and 
the first scenario, the fourth scenario. And then for each scenario, you should have two unique gametes generated at the end. So how many total of unique gametes? One, two, three, four, and then you're gonna have a five and six from this scenario and a seven and eight from uh, the last scenario. So the number is correct, right? Uh, two to the third, that's eight possibilities. Okay? So if you know how to draw this, then you should have a pretty good understanding of uh, random assignment. All right, let's move on. And the and now things are much easier, right? So the microtubules, the spindle fibers, are going to pull homologous chromosomes apart. Oh, let me change the color. So this is what's different than mitosis, because in mitosis, anaphase is the sister chromatids are pulled apart, right? But meiosis are different because you're going to do divisions twice. So the first division, what you're separating is the homologous chromosomes. This is a very, very important. There are there's a good chance that you may get a question on this. So the question may say, in which stage of meiosis do homologous chromosomes are separate or they're pulled apart? And the answer is going to be anaphase 2. Okay, So, sorry, the answer is going to be anaphase 1. Anaphase one. Um, I want to show you um, this um, comparison between anaphase 1 and anaphase 2. So in anaphase 1, um, these spots where they're connected, where they're held together, that's the chiasmata, right? If you remember from a previous slide. So in anaphase one, you are separating the chiasmata and pull the two homologous chromosomes apart, and they will be um, distributed to do different cells, to the two new daughter cells. And the anaphase two, which is very similar to mitosis, this time you are going to pull the two sister chromatids apart. And this is going to end up in one cell, and this is going to end up in the other cell. Okay, So that's the differences between anaphase 1 and 2. So let me repeat. If I ask you, in which stage of my meiosis do homologous chromosomes are pulled apart? The answer will be anaphase 1. If I say, in which stage do sister chromatids uh, get pulled apart, get separate? Uh, the answer will be anaphase 2. Okay, so let's keep moving on. So telophase cytokinesis, uh, this is pretty straightforward. I'll let you guys read it and get familiar with it. Okay. Now we are entering meiosis two. Now the, the main goal for meiosis two is to separate. You can guess sister chromatids, sister chromatids. Yeah. So what's the main goal for meiosis one? You should know by now, I just mentioned that. You want to separate what? Right, homologous chromosomes. So I'm going to say big H, homologous chromosomes. All right. Um, so meiosis 2 is very, very similar to mitosis, um, pretty much the same. So um, at the beginning of meiosis 2, each dividing cell has only one set of homologous chromosomes. But remember, for each chromosome, you have a two sister chromatids. So you are just going to separate those two systems. Um, again, this is pretty straightforward um, since it's similar to mitosis. So you can just read this um, and let me know if you have any questions. Okay, Meiosis 2, there we go, it's about the same. So sexual reproduction, nearly all eukaryotes undergo sexual reproduction. And why is that? Because it's a very successful strategy to give you, to generate favorable traits so that the organism can survive and reproduce better in the ever-changing environment. Okay, so we mentioned this a little bit um, at the beginning of the lecture. So again, you really need to understand that genetic diversity is good for the organisms because by chance, you may have a very good combinations of um, genetic makeup that will give you features that will make you um, kind of at a very out of a dangerous uh, situation than everybody else so that you can um, live longer, um, mate more, and generate more offspring. That's how we define success for living organisms. All right, now whilst is the fertilization alternate in sexual life cycles. So 
we have three main categories of life cycles. So diploid dominant. So the life cycle is dominated by a diploid stage. And the second one, that kind of gas is dominant by haploid. Um, or for certain uh, organisms, it's an alternation between diploid and haploid. So again, this part is very easy to understand. So uh, again, I'll just leave it to you to kind of read your textbook and get familiar with it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on to the um, more important and difficult parts to understand. So genetic variation in meiosis, this is just kind of a repeat of the, the previous materials. So make sure you read this and understand everything. There will be questions on this. So um, for example, I may have a question asking you, what are the sources of genetic variation in meiosis? And your answer will be crossing over and random assortment of homologous pairs during which part? Meiosis one or meiosis two? Meiosis one, right, right before uh, metaphase one. Okay, so um, hopefully this will help you understand uh, random assor assortment too. Um, I'm just really concerned that a lot of students wouldn't have a good grasp of the concept. So I put more uh, slides and figures over here. Okay. So hopefully you find one of the figures helpful. So the last few slides talk about chromosomal structural changes. So um, cytologists, so what are, so who are cytologists? So what do they study? Cytology, cyto means a cell and logic means a study, right? So these people will study the cell. So they have categorized numerous structural ring arrangements in chromosomes, but chromosomes inversions and translocations are the most common. So you probably um, are not familiar with this, but the chromosomes actually change and move all the time. So you may have these two types of ring arrangements, um, inversions and translocations. So both have been identified during meiosis uh, by the adaptive pairing of rearranged chromosomes with their former hom uh, homologs to maintain appropriate gene alignment. Okay, so don't worry about this part. Um, I'm just going to show you some pictures of chromosome inversions and translocations. Uh, just make sure you understand what each one is about. Okay, so when we talk about inversions, uh, these are two types of inversions. So inversions, uh, unlike translocations, involve detachment. So certain segments are going to detach from the main chromosome, and they may flip. And they're going to be reinserted into the chromosome. So I'll show you uh, how they work you know, in, in a second. So we have pericentric inversions and we have a paracentric inversions. They're very different. So pericentric inversion, as you can see in this, in this program, in this graph, uh, if we uh, assign letters to different segments of chromosomes, so okay, A, B, C, D, E, F, and this uh, blank part, this represents central mirror. Central mirror, remember, this is the, the part like where everything kind of gets narrowed down a little bit. So if you have a segment um, that are detached and flipped and go back to the chromosome, that involves the central mirror. That's going to be pericentric inversion, right? So C and D, these two sections include the central mirror. So they flip. And now when you look at the chromosome, you have a D and a C. So that's called a pericentric inversion. Now, if you have segments that are uh, that do not include the central mirror, um, you have those segments flip, then that's going to be paracentric inver inversion. So let's say you have here E and F, they flip. So now you have F, E. That will be paracentric inversion. Or if you have A and B, that will exchange, you have a B and A here, that will also be paracentric. Um, all right, let's see here. So translocations involve the insertion of a piece of DNA from one chromosome into a non-homologous chromosome. So uh, here, we have a two chromosomes right here. Now I'm gonna ask you, are these homologous chromosomes? 
The answer is no. Remember, homologous chromosomes are just two different versions or copies of the same type of chromosome. So they should have the, the same uh, shape and size. But you can see these two are very, very different, right? One is very long and the other one is very short. So they're definitely not homologous chromosomes. And if they exchange segments of the chromosome, that will be translocation. Okay? So this happens to two non-homologous chromosomes, while inversion happens within one chromosome, within one chromosome. And this happens between two different chromosomes, and they're non-homologous chromosomes. Um, okay, so uh, you can see this part comes off and it's gonna exchange, it's gonna uh, be exchanged with this blue section. So this is the end product. And you can see that the lengths of the chromosomes are totally different now, right? So previously the blue one's very long, but because it lost that bigger section in exchange for a smaller section, so now it's shortened. And then the previous orange one gets like a lengthened, right? It's much longer than before. So this is translocation. So what if this happens to homologous chromosomes? If you have two homologous chromosomes and they exchange certain sections, what do we call that? crossing over, right? That's crossing over. So that's why the translocation happens to non-homologous chromosomes. Uh, karyotype, just to know the definition. So karyotype is the number and appearance of chromosomes. So to obtain a view of the individual's karyotype, cytologists, people who study cells, photograph the chromosomes. And then they cut and paste and sort all the chromosomes and they make a chart. And the chart is cal called a karyogram. Okay. So on the test, if I ask you, uh, what is karyotype or what is karyogram, you should know what it is. So here is an example of a karyogram. So you can see that it contains all the 23 chromosomes, right? Oh, sorry, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So it's a total of 46. Now here's my question. Uh, first question, is this a female or a male? Based on the karyogram, female or male? How can you tell? Go to this sex chromosome. So it's two X chromosomes. So that means it's going to be a female. Okay. Now, my next question is, does this person have a normal number of chromosomes? So is the number normal? And yes, right? For each chromosome, you have two copies. Two, 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 two. Everything has two. Okay. So the number is normal. So what if you have an, an extra chromosome right here? Is that still normal? No. So that means this person's cells have one extra copy of this particular chromosome. And if it's chromosome 21, that person has Down syndrome. Okay. Now disjunction. So what is non-disjunction? So disjunction means um, you separate the chromosomes properly. So non-disjunction just means that for uh, whatever reasons that the chromosomes are not separated. So this could apply to homologous pairs or the two sister chromatids of the same chromosome. Okay? So uh, non-disjunction may occur in meiosis one or meiosis two. So if it happens in meiosis one, which is shown over here, that means the homologous chromosome pair uh, is not uh, split, is not pulled away properly. So as you can see in this picture, this is the equator, right? Okay. And once the homologous, chrom homologous chromosomes are pulled away right from the equator, there is a mistake over here. So you can see the two homologous chromosomes are still together. They didn't end up in one cell. Sorry, they didn't end up in two cells, but instead they all come to this one cell. So um, after meiosis two, then you are going to have an extra copy of a chromosome, right? So these two sister chromatids are from the same chromosome. So instead of a one copy, which is the normal number, like this small chromosome, you, have, you only have a one copy in the gamete, for this chromosome, you have a two copies, which is not normal. Uh, so I'm just going to draw this unhappy face. All right. So that's why you have M plus one. So because you have a one extra copy.
All right. Now for the other cell, you have uh, you are one chromosome short, right? So instead of one chromosome in each cell, you should have a big one. So you should have a big one. So you should have two. But right now, because of the non-destruction in meiosis one, you only have uh, one instead of two. So you're one short. So the number is a one minus, uh, sorry, n minus one. Okay. So this is a non-destruction in uh, meiosis one. Now, what will happen if you have non-destruction in meiosis two? So this is what happens. Uh, if you look at the, the bottom picture, so this is the equator, the equator meiosis one uh, separation is good because the homologous, chromos uh, the homologous chromosomes are separated and they end up in two cells. Uh, when they go through meiosis two, so this chromosome is good because the two sister chromatids are pulled away, right? But when you look at the second chromosome, when you look at the second chromosome, you can see that the two sister chromatids are not pulled away. So they end up in, in, in one cell instead of two cells. So for this particular cell, you're going to have an actual copy of the chromosome. So you're going to have a one, two, and a three. So again, you are one over. So that's n plus a one. And then over here, because you are short of a one chromosome, so you are going to have a one, oh, sorry, um, there you go. So you can have a one short. So it's n minus one, all right? Um, so usually this may only happen to um, this daughter cell. So this one is the abnormal one. Uh, for the bottom half, if everything is separated uh, correctly, then you still have the correct number of chromosomes, all right? Now, if the father or the mother contribute the normal number of chromosomes or contribute the gametes with the, the normal number of chromosomes, then everything will be okay. But if they contribute the gametes with abnormal chromosomes, especially if you have extra copy, because those cells are more likely to survive and um, participate in the fertilization process, then you may have genetic disorders. If, if this is chromosome 21, then that's going to be Down syndrome. Okay. So if you have a one chromosome short, well, you have lots of chromosome that's called monosomy, and if you have extra copy that's called a trisomy. All right. So what is Down syndrome then? So Down syndrome, you are you have trisomy because you have a partial or complete copy, actual copy of chromosome 21. So you have actual copy, so that's trisomy. Um, the human zygotes missing one any one copy of autosome invariably fail to develop to birth. So that means if you um, contribute a, a gamete with a monosomy, like a one chromosome less, because the chromosomes usually carry genes that perform you know critical functions. So if you're missing one chromosome, you're missing the those critical functions. A lot of times the embryo wouldn't even develop to birth. Okay? So um, they're not going to become a, a, a baby. Um, but if you have trisomies, because you have an extra copy, right? So you may have overexpressed um, types of proteins. Um, so sometimes um, the offspring can survive you know, from several weeks to many years. So in the case of Down syndrome, people can survive. Uh, a lot longer. Right? Now, usually the, the actual copies of chromosomes happen to these particular types of chromosomes, 13, 15, 18, 21, and 22. So I actually found some um, articles on Down syndrome. So I'll show you real quick. So uh, I bet some people will have this question. So down syndrome is trisomy, but where exactly does that non destruction take place? Does it happen in meiosis one or does it happen in meiosis two? So I found this paper, it's, a very, uh, it's very useful. So they did some uh, research, right? And they found that um, non destruction was paternal, that means it, it's uh, from the sperm. So the, the actual copy comes from the sperm cell. Um, 
in nine cases and was in maternal in 188 cases. So you can see the mother probably has uh, is more likely to uh, cause Down syndrome in the babies. Um, and then among these 188 maternal cases, non-destruction occurred in meiosis 1 in 128 cases. So that means the homologous chromosomes were not separated. And then in meiosis 2, that's 38 cases. So, um, so you can see the majority of cases are actually contributed uh, by non-destruction in meiosis 2. This is actually very, very uh, interesting. And they calculate the percentage. So meiosis 1 era was responsible for 77% 7 of the cases. And meiosis 2 account for um, almost 23% of uh, the cases. But all those cases are maternal cases. All right. Um, the number, let's see, might be different for paternal cases. But the, the, the sample size is really small, right? It's only nine. But let's look at the data. So for paternal non disjunction cases, mouse is one, that's 22%. Mouse is two, it's uh, almost 78%. So it's like a, the opposite of um, maternal non disjunction. But again, I, I don't think they have a really um, big sample size for the paternal cases. All right. Um, there's a one slide that's about X chromosome abnormalities. So you may have a trisomy and monosomy of the X chromosome, which is interesting. Um, I found this website. So triple X syndrome, that means you have trisomy of X chromosome. So you can see trisomy X, or how many chromosomes do you have? 47 in total, because you have an extra X chromosome. So instead of X, X, as seen in normal females, you will have XXX, triple X. So this is genetic disorder and affects, actually this number um, is pretty high than I expected. So one in 1,000 females. So that's kind of interesting. So this is just additional information, all right? Um, and then I'm gonna skip the next slide so you guys can, can read through it. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so I'm gonna stop here.